I'm very happy to see so many of you here and to be here with you today. And we want to talk with you about building and supporting open source communities through metrics. So we'll talk a little bit about metrics and where they, what, what kind of metrics we have. We'll give some examples of how communities have used metrics and how they support decision making. And we'll talk about what does it take to actually get some metrics about your communities and give you some tools and advice on getting started as well. My name is Georg Link. I'm the director of sales at Biturgia and this is Emilio, our uh, marketing specialist. So, uh, you hear me? Yes. So let's take a step back and consider why we are all here today at the Open Source Summit. At the, at the core of open source, we care about using, sharing, and collaborating in the creation of software. With its roots in the free software movement and ensuring the right of software users, open source has evolved from being the realm of hobbyists and volunteers to the, to the enterprise. Collaborative software development has taken on a new dimension in the last five to, to 10 years. Today, open source uh, makes 58% of software in the, in the enterprise. And in fact, 63% of all companies in 2021 survey indicate that they want to increase the, their use and engage with open source. It is now knowledge that open source is present almost everywhere and forms the digital infrastructure we all reply on. First, the, the Heartbleed incident really, really elevates the awareness and it was a vulnerability in an open source project that was used in many web servers to secure connections. The vulnerability existed for several years before being detected and exposed a lot of servers to security threats. Then we have another example, the Strat Equifax uh, debacle that exposed millions of US citizens' personal information also had open source software at its center. A more recent incident was the, low, the log for j security vulnerability, similar to the Heartbleed. This vulnerability was in an open source software library that was used in a lot of other software. And I'm, with these three examples, um, it was no wonder that with these high profile incidents, the US Congress asked the, the open source community about how to avoid these future issues. The US issued a directive mandating more software to play in chain security. And also it looked less like the European Union also is now working on similar legislation and, and guidelines to avoid these, these problems. To, to, to address this challenge, we need to understand how open source software is, is built. This typically involves an open source project. There are different types of open source projects. We have an example of the Mozilla Foundation release a report in 2019 on the different types of open source projects, showing that each is created for a different reasons and has different governance, chooses different licenses, and engage users and other developers to different degrees. Our focus in this presentation is on the open source projects that are built by, by every community. As we know, they are open source projects created with only one maintainer or that are fully controlled by a company. And we are, we are going to exclude this to focus on the projects that have, a, have every community. Our specific focus will be on what challenges you may face and how to overcome them. First, we want to, uh, to explain what our company Viterja does. And we have a history of working on this issue more than 15 years. We are maintainers on the open source Grimoire Lag metrics tools uh, as we are uh, the official metrics partner of the foundations like Open Infra and Nonfocus nowadays. And when the interest grew in community health, we co-founded in 2017 the, the Chaos Project as cooperation with the Linus Foundation in collaboration between industry, academia, and open source. So talking about the Chaos community, community uh, this community has defined more than 70 metrics and maintains software for getting insights that you need. And so now let's, we can see the, uh, some examples of what are those, those metrics that they are measuring this, in this community. We see in the Chaos Framework that they divided these this metrics in five working groups. 
we we can see these five working groups and they have the the each group have their their own focus areas the first group is the the commons metrics where the goal is to understand what contributions uh, from organizations and people are being made they fa they has focus areas such as contributions time people and place and one example metric we can find in this in this group is the type of contributions the we can in, in where we can measure the types of contribution are being are being made the the second working group is the value metrics where the goal here is to identify the degree to which a project is valuable to researchers and academic institutions the focus areas in this group are the academic value communal value individual value and the organizational value and one, one example we have here in this group is the, the project velocity metrics in which we can find what is the development speed for any organization. The third group is the evolution metrics where the goal is to aspect, uh, are aspects related to how the source code changed over time and the mechanisms that the project has to perform and control those changes. The focus areas here are code development activity, efficiency, the code development process quality, the issue resolution, and community growth. And one example metric is the new contributions, new contributors, sorry, how uh, we can see how many contributors are making their first contribution to give project and who are they also. Then we have the diversity, equity, and inclusion metrics where in the goal is here to identify this diversity, equity, and inclusion aspects for, for, the, for the communities. The focus areas in here are the event, event diversity, governance, leadership, and projects and community. One example here, for example, in, for virtual, virtual events, is the time inclusions, where the organis organizers of virtual events be mindful of attendees and speakers in, in, other, in other time zones. And the last group is the risk metrics, where the goal is to understand how active a community exists around or to support a given software package. The focus areas in here are the business risk, the code quality, dependency risk assessments, licensing, and security. And the, the, the sample metric here is the elephant factor. With, uh, with this metric, we can measure what is the distribution or, or work in the community. Thank you for switching the mic. Now that we have seen there are 70 different metrics defined, there are a lot more metrics that have not been defined yet. There's many different options for what we could be measuring to support and grow our communities. So I wanna show you some examples of what some communities have looked at uh, before and what kind of decisions that drives. And I'll start off with uh, new contributors and contribution metrics and to understand the, the, the activity in a project through that. The, when we look at an open source community, one of the things that is naturally occurring is that contributors are becoming inactive after a time. They might change their jobs, they might lose the interest in the project, they have personal things happening and just move on. And that is normal and healthy and that's okay. But we need to have new people coming onto the project for it to be sustainable and healthy. And so what we are looking for is, are we bringing in new people and is the activity level staying healthy over time? And one example where we can see this is in a report from the Mautic community. Uh, I took this from a, the community report published in 2020 where this chart shows how many new contributors showed up. This is based on the commit log. So someone who made the, their first commit during these months. And this is a five, month, a five year analysis. And what we see here over five years, the community went through different stages. At first there was a, a somewhat lower activity level and then the community grew and there were more people coming in and then it dropped off again after a while. And to, to see this, we, the, the community report also looked at the level of activity. And during that time frame where a lot of people joined, there was also a lot of activity in the community. 
and then we saw it dropping off. And when you read the report, they were implementing changes after seeing this drop off to build a stronger foundation for growth again, implementing new processes. And you can see the impact here in the end where they were starting to regain some of the momentum. And I, this is the conclusion that is written in the report where these metrics have been used to really show that, hey, what we are doing is working, but then also to say, okay, we need to do certain activities. And so as we are growing and supporting our communities, it is good to have these metrics in place to see is what we're doing effective or do we need to try something else? And then we make small adjustments over time and they just keep building the momentum. And that's how we are growing our communities. Another example is looking at organizational diversity. And this is how many companies are involved in an open source project. Because when you have, all, even if it's a lot of people, if they're all employed by the same company and now the project is becoming less important or they pull the support, that project might just go away. So a strategic goal of some communities is to have a lot of different organizations working together so that it's not dependent on just one. One community that is very mindful of this is the Drupal community. And every year, Dries is publishing a report showing how many organizations are involved. What is the level of activity? Uh, these charts are from, the, from last year's report. And there was a drop off from the year before in total number of contributors by 10%. But the number of organizations that they were working for was only reduced by 2%. So the foundation of companies that were still standing behind contributions to the Drupal community was still a solid uh, foundation, not much different from the previous years, even though COVID happened. One of the things that Drupal has done that is really remarkable to track this is they have a sophisticated credit system where all the contributors, when they make contributions, can declare, I am doing this for me as a volunteer, I'm doing this for my employer, or I'm doing this as client work for a client. And that's why I like to highlight Drupal because that is the most sophisticated that I've seen in all of open source for how this is being tracked. And I, I hope at some point this gets into GitLab because they're switching to GitLab and there is an open feature request that is being discussed. More on that if, if you want outside of this talk. And so looking at these, these numbers, we see that the number of organizations supporting Drupal stayed mostly consistent, even with the drop off, it still shows there is a healthy support. Another community that I want to highlight is the Kata Containers community. And in this chart, I excluded the founding companies. What we are seeing here, they had the strategic goal of growing the number of organizations contributing to the project. And we can see here this upwards trend of more and more contributions coming from non-founding members. And as more companies are joining, the, color, uh, the, the graph becomes more colorful too. This is attribute to the strategy, but then the metrics are giving support that, yes, the strategy we are following is successful. The, the third and last category of metrics that I want to provide some examples for is around change requests. We have looked at contributors and contributions and organizational diversity, which is about who is doing work. Let's take a look now at how the work is actually done in our community. A lot of us are using pro, um, platforms like GitHub, GitLab, Garrett, where we have these change requests. And in the chaos community, we use change requests 
as synonyms for pull requests or merge requests or change sets because we want it to be vendor neutral. The idea is that we have contributions that are being made and community members are asking for reviews from others or maintainers before those changes make it into the main branch. And so let's take a look at what we can learn from looking at this process. There was another talk this morning that was called cycle time for the time that it takes to first review, first attention, for, and so on. So looking at the Starling X project, it takes an average about four days for a change request to be reviewed and then merged. The four, four days for interaction between the community. Now, this number by itself is interesting, but we need to look at the context around it. And looking at it over three years, we see that during the pandemic, there was a slowdown of overall activity in the community. We see the dip in the graph. And so we might think that, you know, it's, it's getting slower. But looking at the, the time that it takes to review the change request, it actually stayed steady and consistent throughout this entire three year period, which is showing that the community maintained the level of interaction with each other, maybe at a, on, on fewer items they were working on, but the activity level and the energy continued. So this gives us an idea for how things are going in the community by pulling together different graphs and digging into the data about our community. And because we have this data, that's where the community can say, okay, here is something that doesn't look right, so let's do something about it. But for that, we, we, need, we need the metrics, we need the data to make those kinds of decisions. So let's talk about some challenges on actually doing this. From an organizational perspective, something to keep in mind is what are the right metrics to look at? Because we are what we measure. Once we measure something, people start to game the system and adjust their behavior. So we want to be mindful of, of this, uh, figure out what is the strategy, what are our goals, and then work backwards to figure out what questions do we have to answer, whether we are reaching that goal, and then figure out the metrics that help us answer those questions. The metrics can also be simple. We were just talking yesterday at ChaosCon and Don had a really great example of just using four simple metrics to get an idea of the community. Four metrics to just give an, an overview of how things are going. Then we, we need to think about, okay, what do we actually do about these metrics? There are some metrics that are that are actionable, where we can change something in the community to quickly Im influence them. Like if we have number of commits, I, I just had an interesting conversation with the community. We were looking at the commit metrics and one repo had really low numbers, another one had really high numbers. And he said, but those cannot be compared at all because we are squashing all the commits in our pull request in this one repository and have micro commits in this other. And so we need to understand that context of the community also when we're looking at the metrics and making comparisons sometimes is not, not at all what, what we can do. So knowing what is good and knowing what is bad, we need to establish that baseline within the same project, not try to compare ourselves. And then finally, there is also the concern around private personal identifiable information, PII. When we are contributing to open source, we love transparency. That's one of the things that we thrive on in our, our collaboration. And it's, it's good that we know who is making contributions, especially when we talk about trusting the source and trusting the source code. Um, but that means people are leaving their names and email addresses in the commit history, in the email, in the chat history, 
And we need to be mindful of that because we have rules like the General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR, and other ethical concerns as well. So how do we justify doing an opt-out solution, ideally, where we say, okay, this data has been provided by the contributors, they understand it is public, and we are analyzing it for the benefit of the community, we have a justified reason. So anyone who doesn't want to be included in this data collection can let us know, we'll exclude them. But we need to provide that way. If we want to analyze it for any other reason, we might not have a justified way and we have to actually um, do an opt-in process. Like, don't go around scraping emails and advertising to open source developers. It does not go over well. One, one thing to do when we start doing metrics that has worked in our experience really well is to be transparent and honest with the community. To say, hey, we are providing these metrics. Here's the dashboard. Take a look. Here's what we know about the community, about you. And by doing this, then everyone feels a little bit better and comfortable with what we are doing. And it's a resource to the community as a whole. Now, let's move on to some technical challenges. And I have some better solutions for you here. When we want to start collecting metrics, we want to get started. The first thought we have to ask is, where do we get the data from? Where is the community? I want to not just think about where is the source code being developed, but also where are the conversations happening in the community? Mailing lists, Slack, uh, forums. We want to be inclusive of all these spaces because all that information, all that conversation is important. Otherwise, we create a bias towards only the code contributors. And there's so many other activities going on in an open source project that we want to be grateful for and elevate in, our, in the way we recognize contributors. When we get the data, we have several steps that need to happen. We get the raw data, we want to enrich the data, and then present it and make it useful. So let's talk through these steps. When we get the data, the raw data, that's almost the easiest step. There are APIs, there are archives, there are ways to get to the data. And the challenge here is if the source changes, we have to change our tooling that collects the data. Which, uh, spoiler alert, if you use an open source tool, then you don't have to do it by yourself. There's probably a community around you that helps with that. So we can all benefit. Enriching the data, now we are getting to making more out of it, where we want to unify the date formats. We want to look at the level of detail. If we get a git commit, are we just interested in who did what when? Or are we actually interested in how many lines were changed? So we, we need to think about what kind of information do we want to collect and store? And what, what metadata do we collect about it? What context do we store? Then another concern is managing identities. As we are combining data from different platforms, good chance is your contributors are using different usernames or different email addresses. And maybe we want to combine those and say, hey, this same person is uh, active in all these different channels and be able to connect those. Again, PII concern, maybe there are people who are contributing as with their personal and then with their company and they don't want those to be associated. But that is something to figure out with your community. And then there's a calculation process. Some metrics don't come from the raw data. Like we, we can get when an issue is open and when it was closed, but we might be interested in how long was it open. And so we have to subtract the two dates. And then we want to make the data useful. The raw numbers and the raw data by themselves, um, great. But how do we actually support what we want to do? So who is the user of the data and what do they want to do with the data? What kind of stories do they want to tell? And what visualizations help them do that? It is, the way that I think of this is when, when you go explore this beautiful city of Dublin, 
and want to get no more about it, you can get a sheet of uh, 17 whatever hundred this happened, uh, 1204 the castle was built. Just the raw facts are not that interesting. But when you get a guide that walks you through the city and tells you the story and uses the dates and facts to, to back up what he is telling, then it sticks in your head and you get moved and you understand it much better. That's what we want to do with open source communities as well. We want to tell the story and use the data to support that story. So we have open source tools that have solved all of these challenges to an extent where if you want to get started, these are great starting places. In the Chaos Project, we have Grimoire Lab and we have Augur. Cauldron is a platform built on top of Grimoire Lab. Apache has the Kibble Project. The CNCF Foundation has the Dev Analytics. And you're welcome to try these tools and use them as starting points. So we've walked you through metrics and some examples and uh, how you can get started. And I'll let Emilio finish us off. Yes, so just a quick, a quick recap about, the about uh, some lessons and ideas that we see the, in this presentation. First, we saw that how to use metrics to identify where community needs helps and track if actions um, action leads to changes. We also see the to track metrics early and establish a baseline. Then also go for low hanging fruits, easy to get metrics and get and then get more sophisticated later. Also present the metrics in context, tell a story of the community that you are yeah, you are telling. And also be transparent with the community uh, about metrics. Provide public da public dashboards and public uh, reports. So that, that's what from us today. And also, oops, sorry, <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> We're also uh, at the booth uh, when you go into the sponsor area tomorrow and the day after, it's on the right. I think we still have some time for conversation. I always love to hear your thoughts on this, if you have something to share with others or have a question. Yes. So I just want to know if, if in your experience, what was the most, intern, uh, most interesting misrepresented metric? So that somebody, they were per perceiving the community wrongly because they were looking at a wrong metric. So the question for those on, online is, what is the most interesting case that we have seen of a metric being misrepresented or where it created the wrong kind of understanding? Um, one, one misleading one is around the commits where people are assuming that commits means so, some value is being created and equating commit with commit. And when you, when you do that with the example earlier is commits can mean many different things. Uh, you, you have the merge commits, you have documentation commits, there, there might be a commit that just does cleaning up uh, of the code base, refactoring. And even when you look at the number of lines changed, it, it's really difficult to equate those. And, and that, that comparison, I'm using commits as an example, is where misjudgments uh, happen. So, Thank yeah. You. Yes. Um, how do you balance out, or what is your suggestion, or in the communities you saw, balancing out the developer work with kind of doing metrics and a lot of uh, data processing? Because I, I, I think that some people would get to do one or, 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 or the other, and most people choose to do that. And these are useful, but they are maybe we're going to do it later. How do you balance that out? How do you arrange people to actually focus on doing this uh, additional work, even though it's not, let's say, directly useful for the project? I, I mean, in, in terms of uh, doing uh, 
actual commits. So the, the question is how do we balance uh, contributors that want to work on the code and want to spend their time there versus spending it on creating metrics and getting insights to the community. Yeah. And I think that is where in a community you have many different kinds of contributors and some that are more focused on doing the actual coding and they don't need to do any extra work. All the data that we were looking at today is created accidentally uh, or just by being having that trace of what was being done in the project through, through the commit log, through the mailing list archive, there, there's no extra work involved in creating the data. We just need someone who is interested in being a maintainer and having a vision for the community and maybe doing some community management. And they are the ones that would take a step back, look at the data, collect it. Or if you are part of a foundation, then it might already be provided. Um, Open Infra is providing the metrics. The Linux Foundation has the LFX Insights platform. So maybe it's already provided for your project. Yeah. You still need, as you mentioned, that owner. So a manager, a maintainer that can own that and make this happen. Makes sense. Thanks. Yes. This uh, focuses a lot on inputs, uh, not so much on the consumers. So, like, for example, OpenSSL is a project that doesn't get lots of love from the community. It's obviously used by a lot of people. So the question is around not just looking at the activity level data that is in an open source project, but also at consumption and how many projects and uh, consumers are there of a project. Um, the, it's, it's a really difficult one because there is no good data source. It's, it's an unsolved problem we have. There are some solutions. So the OpenSSF Foundation is working with some vendors that are analyzing open source project usage in companies to get some idea of this. Um, the, there's a project called SCARF where you basically install a proxy or use a proxy on your downloads for packages for source code to get an idea for how often does the project get downloaded. Uh, GitHub provides some insights to how often is a project cloned, but even there, it, it's a very inaccurate number because it might just be an answer to how often does someone build their project and is pulling a new version. And so these consumption numbers, there's, there's no good way right now that I'm aware of for getting that number. Um, Once we have more S-bombs, hopefully, there is a better way to get to that. But we have, still have a long way to go to get open source projects to adopt S-bombs on a, on a broad scale. Thank yeah, thank you. Yes? Um, I have two. Two, okay. okay. Let's start with one. Uh, a, what is an S-bomb? Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. So the first question is, what is an SBOM? And that is, SBOM is short for Software Bill of Material. And when it, it's like the nutrition label on food that tells you what are the ingredients that were used to make a, a meal. The SBOM, Software Bill of Material, says these are the software components inside of this software piece. So as we are building on top of libraries and incorporating other software, we keep a list of everything that we're using and then go to the consumer and say, here is my software and here are all the pieces that I've reused from other projects. And ideally you also declare what licenses they use and so on. So that's, that's what the SBOM is, the Software Bill of Material. 
And then the second question was, how do you balance the opaqueness or the, uh, the contributors, the maintainers that want to not expose their PII? And that's a conversation to be had in open source projects, whether you allow that, uh, where someone uses an anonymous account, or where you actually want to have that transparency to, um, to have the trust in who's doing that. Because one of the things that can happen when we don't have the transparency is that someone else comes in as a malicious actor, inserts a backdoor that then gets into all the projects that are using the library. So I don't know if, if you want to go there. But we might be able to come up with a good solution for that. I think uh, if we use Hyperledger and blockchain to verify identities in an anonymous way, there might be some solutions um, that we could work on. But I'm speculating. I'm not very good at in this myself. <laughs> we still have about five minutes, so does anyone have experience looking at metrics and has their own experience that they can share with everyone here? Or what, what kind of tools, if you are using metrics, what kind of tools do you use? Yes? So yeah, we often have to face looking at whether a project is viable over a duration of time. So if you're, if you're comparing two different technologies or two different projects, and you have to decide which of those two is more likely to continue. So an example would be like Docker versus Podman. Um, and one of the, yeah, the, I always call it liveliness. Because I, I want to know if I'm going to recommend that to somebody that they're going to be on the right path to, to go for you know a decade or longer as opposed to a few years. And Docker is a really good example because they sort of had a, it burned really bright and then you know it's changed over time as they uh, as it evolved and had new ownership and whatnot. And yeah, it's very hard to get metrics as to uh, whether a project is viable or not. A lot of the metrics that you put up are things that you need at, uh, in order to make that determination. Um, and, and a big one is probably, like you said, with uh, organizations. Uh, how do you compare individual contributors who are uh, working as a group as part of an organization versus individual contributors who are spread across multiple organizations? And how do you rank that? Um, it's, a, it's a very difficult question. So to, to summarize for those who couldn't hear, uh, this example is, uh, or this use case for looking at metrics is to determine if there are multiple technologies that we could be using, which one is most likely to be the one to survive and be long-term maintained. And so looking at activity uh, metrics and making the case for what is the, what, what's the best uh, guess which one to rely on. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Maybe we can use the microphone if someone else has something they would like to share. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation. It was very good. Uh, just a question in terms of uh, if you get the metrics of, say, for example, the communities, community is not doing well, uh, what are the steps that they take in order to reinvigorate the community? Is, there, is it dependent totally on the org on the, uh, as you said, for example, if something is owned by Linux Foundation, is it the responsibility of that owner, or how does how does the community get reinvigorated? That's a good question. How do you get a community back to back to health? Um, this is where where um, I would recommend looking at some community management best practices for what to do. Uh, probably look at the the community, identify what's actually going on, what's the history, understand a little bit better around the context. Because it could just be that the technology itself has lost its appeal. And so you have to take a different approach. Or is it because you have a, a toxic actor that is pushing everyone else away? Then you need to take a different approach. Or is it because, so, so you need to do some digging to, to understand why the, the community has died down. And then there are 
steps to um, to mitigate that, and that's around what what brings people to the to the project. How do you get the word out? Um, maybe the project itself is set up in a way where it's really difficult for someone to get started, and so you need to work on making it easier to onboard new contributors. And it's community management is a really complex. Uh, topic, so I, I don't have the cookie cutter, nice, here, here's your solution answer. Um, but looking at the metrics can help you identify also other steps that we are taking effective or not. All right. I just got my warning that we are out of time. So thank you so much for joining. Have a great conference. <laughs>